um, with a whole bunch of different tools, equipment, that kind of stuff. Um, Sacramento. So if you were looking around, we have 3D printers. We have, think of us like a big different version of the Student Startup Center, uh, just kind of for everybody around the Sacramento area. We've got a full wood shop with, you know, CNC equipment, the CNC router, 3D printers, metalworking, welding, laser cutters, uh, just a general co-working space. Uh, and all sorts of other stuff, photography lab, electronics lab. Um, and then we teach classes and all these things. The classes are like evening and weekend classes. The idea is you can come here, learn how to build something yourself and then make it yourself. Um, so yeah, uh, we're a cool place. You should definitely come check it out once uh, the world starts opening back up again. Um, but yeah, uh, one of the classes that I teach there quite frequently is uh, an Arduino class. Um, and Arduino, I'm assuming you've all at least Googled it, um, but it's a wonderful uh, prototyping uh, platform for electronics. Um, you can make a lot of really cool stuff, a lot of really stupid stuff, a lot of really cheap stuff, um, and it's really lowered the bar for, uh, for embedded programming and stuff. Uh, yeah, got it. So let's see if this works. I think I can give you a tour of the space. Yeah, so this is like if you walked into our building, this is what you'd see. A lot of this stuff here is actually made in-house. Um, so like the front desk was made here. That couch was actually made here. Sorry, I'm about up this. That that chair was actually made here too, which is pretty cool. Um, if you go back here, you see we have offices that we rent out, lots of different startups and and other uh, freelancer kind of folk hanging out there. Um, there is an alternative high school, uh, a small charter school based thing that exists over here. Um, oh, Don, I recognize you. Um, <laughs> and then we go back here, uh, got some cool new murals. Uh, go back here, we've got a whole shop. Um, also my face with Google eyes up there. Um, we've got, uh, choo -choo -choo. let's go back here. There's a shop bot, CNC router, five by eight. We don't care where you interviewed them. Uh, we, don't, we don't even need you or the word I in this anywhere unless there, there we go. All right, so somebody's got something else going on. I was trying to figure out whether that was a question or just random ranting. Um, anyway, uh, back, oh, I didn't want to go out that far. Like I said, this is still in development. Oh, I can't go this way, darn it. All right, well, there's a CNC router here too, so we can do milling, lots of prototyping and cool stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, just to kind of throw all that out there. Um, so, ooh, can I go in there? Yeah, I can, I've got green screen, photo studio. Uh, I can't go into the electronics lab annoyingly, but that's fine. Um, anyway, so we've got all that fun stuff. Um, and so today I'm going to cover prototyping with Arduino um, from a very beginner standpoint. Um, just kind of, I'll go to the chat to figure this part out, but, um, and I'll keep the chat open. Uh, sorry, I didn't have it open right there, but I'll try to keep the chat open this whole time. Uh, I do have a couple monitors, so that's cool. Um, has everyone experiment? How many people have never actually touched an Arduino? I guess just say yes or no. Yes, yes, I have played around with Arduino. No, I have not played around with Arduino. And just put a yes or no in there so I can get an idea. Yes, cool. We got one yes, two yes, three yes, four no. Five yes, six now. All right, cool. So um, of, of those people who said, yeah, actually of everybody, um, do you have any sort of programming experience? Uh, and that could be, that doesn't have to be like, oh, I'm in a CS program. Oh, I'm in, you know, whatever. It could be just I've messed around with Python or I've messed around with C++ or I've done bash scripting. Um, just so I can get a sense of where we're at there. Yes, for I've done something with programming. No, for I have never touched a line of code before. Yes, but not for a while. Cool. Cool. Okay, brilliant. So, 
Oh, that, that seems good for now. So this class changes depending on who's showing up. Um, a lot of the simple parts of Arduino are really simple, but they don't make sense to somebody who's never touched electronics or hardware. Um, and some of the complicated parts are don't make any sense if you haven't started at the basics. So what I, I do have a presentation and we'll be going through that kind of line by line, just covering each of the basics. Um, but once we get to the actual, I would call it hands-on, but I guess the virtual hands-on part of it, um, part of the, the goal is to get you to try to do something on your own. Um, there's really no point in just sitting here and yelling at everyone. That said, if you have specific uh, Arduino questions, um, I do like to go off on tangents, um, and I do like to go off on questions and keep it a little discussion friendly. Um, when I do this in person, usually there's a lot of discussion and a lot of feedback, um, and so I'm totally open to that. Um, I'm even open to people talking, like you don't always have to ask them on chat if you don't want to, just be respectful about it. Um, I would rather have this a little bit more discussion friendly than just me lecturing or ranting. You have, you have, uh, you have lecture halls and classes for that. Uh, we're, we're a little bit more discussion focused. Um, so with that said, uh, we'll jump right in. Um, just a note, it's recorded. Yes, cool. Um, so let's see, just kind of background on Arduino, what it is. Um, Arduino is a small embedded computer, a uh, little microcontroller, AppMega App 328 for the most common Arduinos, um, running 16 megahertz, uh, two kilobytes of SR RAM, and one kilobyte of EEPROM like program and, and more permanent storage. Um, this picture is one of the this is, I think this is a picture of the actual first prototype Arduino that they got to, but it might be like a later model. Um, you can see it looks like it was milled uh, by like a small CNC router jig, um, not necessarily like a complete printed PCB. Um, I, I love the, the jumper wire just kind of wrapped around one of the pins there and then soldered to a, uh, a connector that might have been pulled out of some old computer or something. Um, the goal of Arduino in the beginning was to present a user-friendly platform for learning embedded programming and electronics. Um, there, Arduino was not the first programming, you know, microcontroller by a long shot, you know, um, and it wasn't even the first with a learning focus. Um, there were a few before it. One of the most common ones was uh, the basic stamp which is from a company called Parallax, which is actually up in Rockland. Um, they're still in business. They're wonderful people. The first first are like the prototype before becoming an Arduino's uh, were prototyped on their hardware. Um, but one of the issues was the boards were like $50 a pop. Um, whereas Arduino's super cheap. Uh, you can usually find these things for under $10, under $5 if you're willing to wait a little bit longer and order them from abroad. Um, that is fantastic. Uh, we do a lot of teaching, not only with Hacker Lab community members, but with, you know, I do side work with other nonprofits where we teach STEM stuff in the community to kids. Um, and I really like Arduino because we can sit the kid down in front of a Linux box that's a refurb computer, probably that we bought from Maggie Surplus, um, and teach them on a free operating system with software that we downloaded for free on a platform that we paid you know, under $10 for. And so if a kid shows interest, we can just let them take it home themselves, uh, which is fantastic. Um, and it really, I really think it allows a lot of people to, to experiment in ways they might not have feel comf felt comfortable before. Um, plus it's super easy to use. It's got a USB, you plug it in, you program it. There's none of that setting up weird tool chains um, that exist with some of the other plat platforms out there. Um, so yeah, that's cool. Uh, this is the pinout of the Arduino, just to kind of get you a sense for what exists here. Um, it looks very, uh, it looks very daunting. Um, how did I do that? No, not that one. So if you can see, you can see my mouse, right? Somebody will tell me if you can't. Um, You'll see a bunch of pins on this side, and then on the right side, we'll call it, and then a bunch of pins on the left side. Um, 
go back to presentation. Those pins on the right are commonly referred to as the digital pins. Um, those are, you get generally two states with them. You can tell them to turn on, which means they apply positive voltage to whatever they're connected to, or you can turn them off, which means they apply no voltage, so ground, or whatever your ground reference is. Um, for those who don't, I guess one more question. Um, yes, for I have, no, for I haven't uh, done any electronics stuff. And that could be, you under, I guess, you understand what voltage is. That's usually a good analogy. Yes, if, yes, I know what voltage is and kind of how it relates to current and resistance. And no, I don't. I, I'm completely new to this electronics thing. I could throw that in the chat. Yes, yes, cool. Yes. We'll consider that good enough, everybody said. Oh no, one now, okay, cool. So the idea is uh, think about a the, the simplest circuit, which is a uh, flashlight. A flashlight has effectively four components. You have a light bulb. Uh, we're not gonna use LEDs, we're just gonna use the old school. Uh, did anyone catch what the purpose of Arduino was? Oh, to build something, to prototype something. Um, so I have some stupid things. Uh, Here's a dumb little board that I designed. Uh, here, I'll stop share, show it here. Uh, so here is a little board with a bunch of LEDs on it, arranged in a seven segment display. And I also put my face on it and it's controlled with an Arduino. And I'll totally plug it in, but it's so bright that it kind of washes out the camera. Uh, but if you look at it sideways, you can kind of see the LEDs. But this is me wanting to create a, uh, an alarm clock with really big digits. Um, and so I designed this board and plugged it into the Arduino and programmed it and that's cool. Um, another dumb one that I have is a uh, push to talk pedal for Discord. Um, so you can use an Arduino to remap some arbitrary keystrokes into a, uh, into a keyboard press. Um, so I press a button, it throws a, a keyboard command at my computer, which enables push to talk like a walkie talkie. So that if I'm playing games, I can use my foot to enable the talking instead of, uh, instead of having to press some weird key press. Um, some more serious ones, uh, I actually have the access control system at our downtown Hackle facility running off a, I'll call it an Arduino derivative. It's a little bit beefier because um, it is running Linux on part of it. Um, and just to manage like the database and stuff, but it controls the door actuators, lets people in or out, that kind of stuff. Um, I've got an Arduino, I've got a couple Arduinos hooked up to different parts of my house for controlling uh, different buttons, a projector screen, lights. Um, if you can see behind me right, there is a 3D printer that is running off of an Arduino Mega or it's in being built. So it's an embedded controller. Um, Anything that you have that's a small device that has a little computer in it is effectively an embedded computer with something controlling it. Um, there's a range of devices out there, some that are smaller, that do really fundamental, you know, rudimentary things, press a button, do this action, record temperature, send it somewhere, whatever. There are some that are a little bit beefier that are maybe showing a touch screen that are maybe more like a full-fledged computer with an operating system running and other fun stuff happening. So that's kind of the the idea here, it, it gives you the ability to think of things that you'd like automated or interactions that you would like to happen or things that you would like to control through software um, and gives you a nice platform to try to do it yourself instead of waiting for uh, somebody else to build the thing. So yeah, hope that is a long-winded way to answer that question. Um, the gen one of the biggest issues I actually see in our Arduino class um, when people show up for it is they say, "Oh, what, what am I gonna? What should I build?" And uh, I don't really have the answer for that. Um, that's kind of your part of it. Uh, I can point you into, I can point you in a direction and say, like, "All right, here's a, you know, Thingiverse, or sorry, Instructables." Arduino projects, right? And I can say here, you want some inspiration? Uh, go here, look, lots of little things. Somebody's controlling a lucky cat. Somebody's uh, making their plant sing. I don't know how that works. Uh, a sound machine thing, an optical theremin. Look, you can build a theremin, a musical instrument. The, the options are down to what you can figure out to do. So uh, we'll figure out how to do. So 
the, the core of what I'm trying to get through today um, is teaching you the basics for how to control certain actions and how to read certain actions and how to interact with some basic electrical circuits. Um, I'm not going to give you some crazy project. Um, if you have a question on some particular device or something that you were trying to use, feel free to share that with me. Um, I'm not above pulling up a, uh, a uh, uh, what do you call it, a data sheet and uh, trying to make heads or tails of it. Um, but most of the stuff I'm going to stick with now is very simple stuff. So um, with this Arduino, we have digital stuff. Uh, digital can be a button that's either off or on. Um, it can be a motor that's either running or not running. It can be a fancy LCD screen that you send data out to. It can be a whole series of buttons. It can be a bunch of other things that I'm not thinking of. Um, over on this left side, you see uh, the analog pins in the kind of bottom left corner. Those are connected to an ADC, um, an analog to digital converter. Um, and what that does is if you have a signal that's not flat zero or one, so um, it's every, if, assuming everyone's familiar with generally what, uh, that's annoying, I have to pull up the chat every time I go back to share screen. Um, are you things you shouldn't build with Arduino? Uh, yes. Uh, don't build anything that can hurt anybody because uh, that's not good. Um, I don't support that. Um, generally speaking, if you need an, the, the way I usually answer it is if you need an operating system uh, or think about whether you need an operating system or not. Uh, that's a good way of saying it. So if what I'm doing is reading some piece of information like temperature or whether a button is pressed or the position of some knobs or, uh, you know, whatever, and just sending it someplace else or doing something quick with it. An Arduino is perfect. It's cheap. It's low cost. It'll help you out. Um, if what I'm doing is doing machine vision stuff remotely um, or doing trying to control a camera or drive a complicated touch screen that has more than just a couple buttons or uh, do some heavy math, um, heavy as in more than just a little bit of, uh, you know, like, if I was if I was thinking about doing this with large matrices in linear algebra, then Arduino is probably not for you, or not for that task. Um, there are other options out there. Raspberry Pi is the big one. Um, Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi is a, a single board computer. It's strangely about the same size as an Arduino. However, it is a full fledged computer. You can hook up a monitor, uh, use an SD card as the hard drive. Uh, hook up a keyboard and mouse, an Ethernet port, and it looks like a regular computer. Um, it's a little bit more powerful, or I mean, sorry, less powerful, um, but it'll work. Um, it's overkill for some situations. It's uh, not good enough for others, so just kind of keep it in mind. <clears throat> Usually, uh, look at your, if you can do it with an Arduino, then that's probably a good solution. Um, if you can't figure out how to do it or you need a database or you need something heavier, uh, then leave Arduino and go elsewhere. Um, that said, there are different types of Arduinos and we'll go back to that pinout in the, uh, a little bit more. Um, so on this left side, you see the Pro Micro and the Leonardo. They're cool because they're slightly bigger processors. They have more RAM, they have more storage. Um, they're still relatively inexpensive. Um, I just got some Pro Micros, I think three for like $20 on Amazon. Um, they're cool though, because they can do USB client uh, operations. So for like my foot pedal that I want to act like a keyboard, that's the one I went with because it had the ability to act like a USB human interface device. And the, I just plugged it into the computer. The computer didn't know that it wasn't a keyboard. Um, in the middle is an interesting one that's kind of on the newer end. It's an ESP32. It's awesome because it's still super cheap, like still under $10, um, but it has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on board. Um, and so you sometimes, ESP32 is really just this, just the chip that's underneath this cap. Um, this whole thing is a, typically referred to as a node MCU, um, but it's completely Arduino compatible. You can use the same like coding language, the same IDE to program for it. You just have the, the pins are in different places. So you just have to pay attention to where those, those pins are. Um, and so that one is kind of my go-to favorite right now. 
just because I love being able to like a, a stupid, a wonderfully stupid uh, application is uh, at my house. I have a uh, a Raspberry Pi. That's this is a Raspberry Pi and a few Arduinos. This can this should only be accessible here. Uh, dang it, it's not showing up. I think I might be on a different VLAN right now. Sorry, can't see it here. All right, well, anyway, um, I have a, oh, here, I can show it this way. Uh, I have a local server um, that is an Arduino that's running. Um, and what it can do is uh, I have a web page. Um, I go to the web page. There's a couple different buttons. Uh, I can only get onto the web page if I'm on a specific part of my specific local network. Um, and when I go there, I see this. And it's got a bunch of buttons. I can go up or down. It's all really cool. I've got like a button for turning on the projector and turning off all the lights and all that stuff. Um, some of those integrations are really, really kludgy. Um, like for my projector screen, it's a projector screen that will go down or go up. I took the remote from the projector. I took it apart. I uh, soldered some wires to the button pads and then hooked those up to a relay and connected those to a node MCU. Um, and that was it. It took an afternoon to set it up and now I can push a button uh, and lower my projector screen, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, ESP32s are awesome. Um, up here in the right hand corner, this is kind of like Arduino's version of the Raspberry Pi. It's the Yun. It has Linux on it. It is a full fledged computer with a full fledged operating system. In my opinion, it's a little bit weird, a little bit janky, but uh, it exists, so you should know about it. Um, down here is the weirdest one that I found. Um, it's really cool though. Uh, it's an MKR VDOR 4000. It's actually produced by Arduino. Um, but uh, when Intel bought out uh, Cypress, uh, or sorry, not Cypress, uh, Altera. Um, they started putting FPGAs in weird places, um, and Intel works with Arduino closely. They're not, uh, they're not the same company, but they are friends. Um, and so this one strangely has, it, it's an Intel-based FPGA on an Arduino board with an ARM Cortex M0 microcontroller. And if you're a nerd or you're into microcontroller stuff, you, I think you, you get a sense for how weird that is. Um, but it is cool. Um, if you, FPGAs are frequently used in industry for doing really complicated machine control, um, they're becoming more useful as single purpose uh, uh, devices within computers or within servos. Um, FPGAs are kind of like a compromise between hardware and software. Um, the idea is you want some, it, ideally, if I had a computer that sole purpose was to render uh, 4K video and literally nothing else, um, the fastest way to do that would be design hardware explicitly for doing that. Um, however, everyone wants their computers to be able to do other stuff too, so that doesn't make any sense. It'd be really expensive, whatever. Um, so instead, you implement a lot of that in software, and you maybe build some hardware, like the graphics card, for very specialty things. The FPGA is kind of like a middleman. Um, say you have some tasks that this computer is pretty much dedicated to doing over and over again. It needs to happen fast. It needs to happen very reliably. Um, you can throw it into an FPGA, which is like a reprogrammable circuit, kind of, um, and get speed boosts out of it there. So it's an interesting one. Um, yeah. To be fair, I have one and I haven't found a good use for it yet, so uh, yeah. Um, normally uh, with Arduino, uh, you program it with uh, the Arduino IDE. IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. Um, if you want to download it, uh, arduino.cc, you'll be able to find it. Um, it looks like this here on the right. Um, there's, it's C++ really um, with a different set of libraries. Technically it's called wiring. Um, but the real biggest difference is you don't have the common things like C out and all the other standard library features. Instead, you have Arduino specific library features. Um, so if we're doing things like setting a pin high, you'd say digital write pin number and then high, right? And that's really cool because if anybody here has worked with uh, other microcontroller platforms, uh, sometimes they can get a little daunting um, and a little uh, convoluted. Um, 
a, a good one that I know so you sometimes encounter at Davis is the MSP430 or some of the Cypress uh, controller or uh, microcontrollers out there where uh, in order to toggle a single pin high, you end up XORing like two bytes together to figure out what flags are controlling an internal pull up resistor and what are setting, whether it's input or output or whatever. Um, so, this Arduino, the goal is to that you take a hit in efficiency, in code efficiency, and in exchange for that, you get simplicity and readability. Um, so, Arduino is a fantastic starting point uh, for prototyping. It's fantastic for one-offs and things that you want to run your house. It's fantastic for hobbyists, proof of concept, startup, small business, that kind of stuff. It's not the best for, uh, I wouldn't use the Arduino platform as a whole in an end-use product that I was shipping out to somebody. Um, for that, you know, once you've got your proof of concept, when you're trying to refine it and get in, into as small as a package as possible, that's when you want to consider diving into the full world of embedded where you're paying attention to exactly how much RAM you have and whatnot. Um, Cause that's something to, you know, remember the Arduino has two kilobytes of RAM. Like we're not used to that these days. Uh, this computer that I'm on, what do I have? Uh, this PC, cool, uh, properties. Let's see what I got. Uh, here, you get my Windows product ID now. Um, this is 16 gigabytes, right? We're, we're talking about one or two kilobytes of RAM. You, you could barely hold a modern JPEG in that. Uh, so obviously certain things like that it's not good for. And that's been a thing with embedded devices for a long time. There are, uh, you, it's like regular computer programming, but with much tighter restrictions. You have to think about how you're using RAM. You have to think about how you're using storage. You have to think about how you're using your input and your output resources and your processor time. Um, because if not, you'll overload it. Um, and yeah, so I think that might speak back to things you should do. So back to this a little bit, um, controlling uh, the digital pins are the simplest, right? Um, so say I have my flashlight circuit, which I alluded to before. Um, my flashlight circuit is very simple. I have a light, I have a switch, I have a power source like a battery, um, and that's it. And when I turn the switch on, I connect the circuit, Current flows from the positive terminal of the battery to the negative terminal, unless you asked a physicist, and then it flows from the negative terminal to the positive terminal, but whatever. Um, and that flow of current, those electrons do work uh, and produce heat and light in the filament, um, and it shines, and that's cool. And that happens as long as I have that positive end of the battery terminal at a higher voltage than the negative end. So if the battery, the battery gets old after an amount of time, all of a sudden it won't be producing a positive voltage anymore, or it won't be producing a voltage that's high enough. Um, and at that point, you will no longer see light. Um, or you can think of the switch doing that. You are attaching voltage to the positive or to the top side of the, uh, of the, uh, the light, or you're not. You can think of each of these digital pins like a switch that you can control with uh, software. So you can turn the switch on, and then whatever it's connected to will be receiving power from it. And we'll see it at five volts. You can turn it off, and it'll be at ground at zero volts. Um, and with a couple of them, you can pulse really quickly, which by some devices gets seen as an intermediate value. It's called pulse width modulation. So that's how you do some kind of analog stuff. Um, and then you can also read in data that way too. Is a switch turned on or is a switch turned off? Is, uh, is there data being pulsed in kind of Morse code style through one of these pins? Those are all things that you can do with those digital pins. Um, and for those of you, so going back to assuming that you know the difference between digital and analog. Digital is, I can represent a picture, right? This picture that's on the screen um, in a couple different ways uh, through technology. Um, in the past, what they do, what you had is a, you know, an old uh, electron gun based uh, television that is constantly scanning data onto the screen and data is sent in a waveform. You have a continuous function. 
um, if you have uh, the amplitude of your wave at, you know, some height, uh, you can represent any value between that. So uh, if I was running on a five volt system, um, this could be anywhere between zero and five volts. It could be zero, one, 1.1, 1.1, 1, 1.0, volts, and all of those come out a little bit different. So a quick way to visualize that is uh, when you got interference on one of those older analog TVs, you, it usually represents itself as colors distorting, things kind of slightly moving out or getting wavy. Um, whereas with a lot of newer media forms, um, instead of that kind of just subtle distortion, what you see is either just the entire picture drops or you see pixels start popping up and doing weird things there. Um, that's because data is being sent digitally. Instead of sending a waveform, like an audio signal right through a wire where we're moving the wave up and down and in and out, um, we're sending a series of zeros or ones, zero, 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 or one, 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 right? Um, or one, zero, one, one. And the advantage there is that any, at any given point, that signal is either low, completely off, right, zero, or it's high, completely on. You don't have to worry about interference bumping the value of that, uh, of that signal slightly up or slightly down. It's either off or on. And it makes it a little bit more, I'm not gonna say immune, a little bit more resistant to interference, um, which is a good thing for uh, a lot of our modern systems. But at the same time, you know, we can't just pipe audio straight into a speaker and have the, the same signal that's carrying the power actually move the speaker cone, right? We, we have to translate it back into, we have to translate it into the digital, do some processing on it and send it back out, convert it back to an analog signal or something approximating an analog signal. So that's, that's kind of digital analog. Uh, if anybody's confused on that, uh, feel free to speak up. <coughs> so um, with that said, we can move forward. Um, what we're going to do, kind of, this, if this is the usage, this is the socially distanced usage slash I want to prototype uh, at home and I don't want to get this hardware, I can't get this hardware or whatever. Um, realistically, all this stuff is fairly cheap and online. And for under $10, you can probably build up you know, everything that we're going to do today and order it for yourself. And you might have one in front of you. And if you do have this in front of you, you can totally follow along with it. Um, this is, an, this is a digital represent or a, a computer representation of the, or graphical representation of what we're doing, uh, with the electronics. Um, so feel free to follow on there. Um, or you can just follow along with Tinkercad. Um, so Tinkercad is a program put out by Autodesk. Um, it's, uh, I put simulation in quotes and proto prototype, um, for anybody who's in the electro electronics, uh, electrical engineering or electronics or embedded sphere. Um, I'm sure you've seen spice at some point. This is not spice. This is not doing component level simulation to that degree where you're describing electrical characteristics. Um, for that you use spice, um, <laughs> or, you know, model sim or, one of those other things that are out there, um, or math. Um, but this allows you to prototype based on the most common Arduino components. Um, and that's kind of in line with what the goal of Arduino is. It's not, it's to kind of give you the ability to not have to get into the weeds on some of the more electrical engineering or computer engineering topics, um, and still be able to create something very functional, very powerful, very cool. Um, so yeah. So uh, Tinkercad, it can cover most basic sensors and components. It can simulate some electrical characteristics. It's more like an accountant than a real simulator. That's more like an accountant than a physicist. So it'll tell you if you're putting too much power through something, or at least if it thinks you are, or if you're hooking two outputs up together and you have, you know, you're trying to drive have two, two things drive the same line at the same time, and it's pretty smart about that. Um, and it can export to the Arduino IDE, so you can use this code and use this circuit base to build something um, later. What it cannot do is complex simulation and em emulation. Like I said, you need something like Spice for that. Um, custom libraries is a thing that really annoys me that it can't do. Um, you get one file per uh, project, which is really annoying. However, if you're into programming, you could always just dump your library code into the beginning of the project and use it that way. Uh, that is perfectly you know, viable. It's just 
you get a really long project that way. Um, you just, you're manually linking in all the libraries. Um, custom components, it can't do. However, it's got a pretty good library of the common ones. Um, and it can't do PCB creation. Um, PCB creation is really fun and uh, the more complex you get, uh, you know, why, why would I want a, a breadboard that looks like this that has a bunch of things sticking up and I can't remember what was going on and where uh, when I could, you know, send out for a PCB and this, I got 20 of these for $25 and they were here in six days. Like, that's awesome. We're, we're in the future as far as I'm concerned. And I was using free software to make that too. You know, it was KiCad. So uh, I like to, you know, I, I don't, I typically go straight to breadboard, but occasionally I do use something like uh, Tinkercad or Fritzing is another similar one without the, the simulation um, to kind of draw it out. Um, if I'm just sketching it, you can think of that like a napkin. Uh, but then I either transition to like a soldered breadboard or just go straight to a PCB, do the design there, order it, um, just because I'm tired of doing really small finagly wiring. Um, yeah. So uh, for this, we'll be using Tinkercad and so I'll switch over there. Um, just a quick one over on more into those inputs and outputs. Um, this is obviously a non-exhaustive list, um, but can kind of give you a sense inputs. Um, simple digital on off, those are like buttons or a line sensor, which is a one dimensional camera. It tells you whether it sees dark or it sees light um, and gives you a high or a low. Um, PIR sensors, uh, those are uh, uh, passive IR sensors, um, can kind of do some motion detection and they'll give you a high or a low if they detect motion. Um, analog, these are continuous value. They have to go through the ADC. It's a potentiometer. A potentiometer is a knob. Um, any knob that you have that has a start and an end uh, is probably a potentiometer. It's a resistor that can vary its value. You find them everywhere. Uh, yeah. A thermistor, which is a small device that will change uh, its resistance with the temperature. And so you can use that to kind of measure temperature. Um, another one is a photodiode, um, which will, instead of it, think of it kind of like the opposite of an LED, it will uh, let current through based on whether it's, uh, it sees light or not. Um, ask a physicist how that works, not me. Um, and then uh, complex things using a library. So that's like the ultrasonic range finder, which we can actually do without a library. Um, a fancy temperature sensor, uh, so like a TMP36 or an IR receiver. Um, you can think of it like a button you read by measuring as to whether it's on or off, right? Is the button pressed or is it not pressed? Um, with a more complicated library, like a fancy temperature sensor, it's actually sending digital data over to you. Um, that is in some protocol that can be just serial, uh, which is on, off, on, off, on, off. It can be uh, something that has addresses. that's a little bit more complicated, um, like CAN or I squared C, or it can be SPI, which is just a fire hose of data. Um, think of that like uh, Morse code. You are tapping the signal onto a switch and that data is being sent uh, over the line. So it goes one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one. And then what that binary data means on the other end is up to your program. Um, or what the, you know, what the form of it being sent is, it's entirely up to your program. So yeah. Um, over on this other side, we have outputs. Um, simple digital outputs like uh, on and off, those are an LED or a relay. You can turn them on, you can turn them off. That's about it. Um, with an LED, you can get a little bit fancier. Uh, it's analog, fake analogs, PWM, it's pulse width modulation. And that's where you pulse the, the digital pin so quickly that it acts like uh, it's not at full voltage or at zero voltage, and so you can control like the, the brightness of an LED um, or a DC motor uh, through something like a MOSFET um, or the really complex ones, which are other devices that you might need to control, um, like addressable LEDs. That's what I have in my little board. Each LED actually has a little microcontroller in it or a little circuit, it's not much of a microcontroller. And I can tell each LED what color I want it to be. Um, with servo, you can control the position through PWM. With screens, like little LCDs or OLEDs, you can pulse data to them and tell them what to display. So you can do screens on an Arduino, it's just a little bit 
more rudimentary. Um, so now uh, one last thing before we jump right into starting with the uh, the um, the actual Tinkercad program. Um, but that is what a breadboard is. Uh, when I teach this in person, um, it depends very much on how familiar with electronics the attendees are, um, if they understand the concept of a complete circuit or not. Um, and the breadboard is really hard to teach with um, for somebody who doesn't know what a complete circuit is because you can't see the path, right? If I was using wires to build something, right? Like you can see these wires here and you know that power goes up through this one and then comes back out, you know, through this one. This is where current's flowing. If I wanted to make my, you know, light bulb uh, a circuit, I can grab a light and some alligator clip wires and make the circuit and show you what it means. With the breadboard, it's not as clear, um, but it's pretty simple. You just have to remember what's going on. So each of these little black holes, I can plug a wire into. Here is a, if you see, I'm sure you can see my, my screen somewhere on there. Uh, put this really close. Um, you can see here's a physical version of the breadboard and I have all these little wires sticking out of it. Each one of those wires can go into one of these little holes. Um, Underneath the breadboard, like if I were to rip the back off of one of these and destroy it, um, all of these holes that are in one of these blue rectangles are connected. So if I wanted to connect two components together, I can put the leg of one of them in one of those holes and then the one right next to it or the one next to it, and it's all good. Um, on this side here, same thing, but in these horizontal rows, um, everything along this black bar is connected to itself to each other and everything along this red bar is connected to each other um, This lower black bar is not connected to this upper black bar um, Unless you connect them you can always run a wire between the two of them and that's totally fine um, and each one of these rows that is connected uh, is broken across this center channel so just a little bit of terminology um, you'll see me refer to these, the red plus and the black minus ones as the power and the ground rail. The ground rail is the, the ones that holds along the black line. The power rail is the ones along the red line. Um, and then the center gap I refer to as the IC channel um, because it's perfect width to put a little integrated circuit across. Um, I think I can show you there. There's a little circuit that's kind of straddling the gap in the middle there. Um, so that's what that's what it's there for. Um, so uh, yeah, and now we can jump right in. Um, we always start with something very simple. This is actually we're going to go one back just an LED first. Um, so I'm going to switch over to Tinkercad now. Um, and I encourage you greatly to follow along because I really don't think like not, you know, I, I don't think you learn much if you're not actually here doing this. Um, and trying to remember what I said after the fact. I mean, I guess I'll be on YouTube, but uh, it's not as good after the fact, in my opinion, trying to remember. Um, so if you go to Tinkercad and you log in, um, if you have to create an account, cool, create an account. Um, you'll notice on the left here, you get 3D designs, circuits, code blocks, lessons, all that kind of stuff. So lessons are a bunch of like pre-made tutorials if you wanna get into those cool. 3D designs, it actually has a whole CAD system here so you can build stuff if you want. But circuits is where we're gonna be. Um, and I'm gonna create a new circuit. And it's default names are some of my favorites, just Fantabulous Blad, that's a default name. Uh, this is a real name. Uh, this one is another default name, so it's just gonna give you an arbitrary name. But if I create a new circuit, I'll get thrown over to this screen um, where I have all of the stuff. Um, the general is this middle zone is kind of my uh, workspace. On the right here, I have lists of components. Um, by default, it goes to basic, but I switched to all pretty quick. So we can look at all of the different things, excuse me, that exist here. NeoPixels, common LEDs, motors, uh, servos, hobby gear motors, and remote control seven segment display, all sorts of other fun stuff. Um, so yeah, sorry, um, that was going crazy and I'm, I don't want it there anymore. Um, so you can, uh, 
this, this is the wrong window. Sorry about that. There we go. So if I wanted to add a component to this left side, um, I would find it over here. And the two things I almost always start with are a breadboard and an Arduino. So I'm going to find the breadboard. I'm going to use the small one. Actually, we'll use the large. No, I'll use the small one. I'll drag it over here, and it's massive. So I'm going to zoom out. And I can give it a name if I want, but I don't really want to. So I'm not going to give it a name. That's cool. And then I'm going to grab an Arduino and bring it over here. And Shazam, I've got an Arduino and I've got a breadboard. And you'll notice when I'm hovering over things, it's starting to light up. Uh, I can wire things together digitally. So if I want to wire, say, uh, the first thing I normally do is I want to connect this power rail to my five volt source, five volts from the Arduino. And uh, oh, word of warning, um, this is less for when we're doing computer zone and more for when we decide we want to uh, build this for real. Um, this Arduino is plugged, I'm getting power from USB right now. Uh, and that USB in this case is coming from my monitor's USB hub. Uh, so the USB 2.0 spec is really only supposed to uh, guarantee 500 milliamps, which is half of an amp, which is not a lot. Um, most modern USB ports go much higher than that, and the USB 3.0s that you're using to power all your phones are much more than that. Um, so it is totally possible to draw way too much power out of your computer. Um, this is probably only going to be an issue if you start running a very large number of lights. Uh, and it's usually not going to hurt the computer. It's just going to shut down your Arduino. Um, or it'll burn out the Arduino first. Um, but in a couple situations where you are trying to drive really large inductive loads like motors or other weird things, this could be a problem. Um, so typically, when I am trying to control high power devices, like really high power devices, um, <laughs> I either use a junk laptop or I do the programming and then I switch to another power uh, source before I uh, start running the heavy devices. You'll notice right down here, um, I have a USB cable right here and then I have a, another